So I'm really thrilled to introduce to you, Tim and Tom, wonderful authors, um, developed this fantastic book. Tim has been a teacher, administrator, and educational consultant for more than 30 years. He has served on the faculty of Northwestern University, Northern Illinois University, Penn State University, and Northeastern Illinois University. Tom is a licensed clinical social worker. He has worked in schools for 40 years. Tom has been an adjunct professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, Northwestern University School of Education and Social Policy, and Loyola University School of Social Work. Tom also has a private practice in psychotherapy and counseling. And last but not least, Tom and Tim met while they were both working at New Trier High School in Winnetka, Illinois, which is a high school of more than 4,000 students, um, as a, I think, principal, teacher, social worker at the school when they met. And so they've known each other for quite a long time. And this book kind of has been a dream of theirs, so we're thrilled that it's finally come available to all of you. So with that, I'll turn it over. Great. Thank you so much. We're, we're thrilled to be with all of you tonight and to share uh, this work. And, and it really has been, and we were, you know, we've been talking a lot about why uh, we, we wrote this book. And it really comes from um, some personal experiences that both Tom and I had as educators and as school leaders. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think it, it also comes from uh, our real interest in helping others and, and wanting to think about a different sort of approach to schools. And one that we think is, uh, you know, probably has, we've needed for a while. Um, I think things have not gotten better in a lot of ways for kids and adults who work in, and live in, and study in schools. And so our, our hope with the book is that this uh, sort of lays out a blueprint for the kind of schools we think are needed in the 21st century. And uh, uh, we think it, it offers some tips and some hints uh, and, some, and some real guidance as to how to do that. Hmm. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is um, an appreciation for teaching as emotional work. And um, students bring um, a lot into school, into the classrooms, and wanting to provide ways to not only support them, but also to support um, the teachers and staff in schools who also um, carry a lot of sometimes stress, sometimes the joy of being in schools, but also often, very often in touch with the sorrows. So the book is, it's a, you know, a deep dive into a lot of different topics. As we talked about this webinar, we really wanted to take a little bit of a different approach to the material. So I think you're going to find that there are some things we're going to cover here in our, in our next few minutes together uh, that will take you into the material of the book, but it's certainly not taking you into the depth that you're going to find in the book. And uh, we have a, a special other giveaway to do at the end for all of you who want a little bit of more of a deeper dive. Um, but but we really were excited about this topic and and taking this approach to think about you know what are some 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 ways I'm not going to say simple ways but what are some ways that school leaders and again we define school leaders as administrators teachers staff members parents school board members uh, organizations that support schools anyone who really students anyone who really wants to you know help make sure schools are wonderful places to learn in. Um, we really thought about, you know, what are the four or five ways that school leaders could approach making schools a little more mentally healthy, a little more well than maybe they, they were and even happier. Uh, and, and so we really distilled this down to five areas. And, and these are not, you know, big, expensive, huge programs. These are in some ways just changes in our mindsets and how we approach things that we think um, are already happening in most of our schools, uh, but could just be turned up a notch and would make just a big difference in the lives of everybody who's there. So we're gonna go through these five. Um, they're taking a whole child, whole school approach, creating a culture of caring, teaching SEL or social emotional learning skills, understanding neuroscience, 
and shifting to restorative practices. So we're going to walk through those. Please feel free as we go. If you want to put a question in the chat or a comment that uh, we could pick up as we're going, we're happy to do that. And uh, we'll, we'll sort of see what we'll also have time for questions at the end. So our first is to take a whole child, whole school approach. And, and you know, we really spend some time at the beginning of the book uh, talking about these two mental models. Uh, and mental models are those things that we keep in our heads that help guide our thinking. Um, I know we've got someone on from Australia and my one trip to Australia, the mental model that I had to readjust while I was there was driving on a different side of the road, making sure I looked a different way when I was crossing than I was normally used to here in the States. That's a mental model. We have these in our, in our brains uh, as, as uh, constructs that, that sometimes can help us. They can be shortcuts, but they can also get in the way. So one of the mental models we really feel strongly about is starting with the students and, and thinking about kids as more than just a test score, more than just a letter grade, uh, to really think about the whole child. And that means thinking about the academic, the social, the emotional, the physical, uh, the spiritual, all the things that make up a person. And that when we start from that place and we think about uh, what are we doing when we approach our building a relationship with a kid? Uh, when we think about uh, when we're working with a staff member or a teacher, uh, how do we approach them and we're seeing the whole person? We get to know who they are. It's little things. It's starting from uh, the moment we first meet them, making sure we say their names correctly, making sure we identify them on a regular basis so they know they are seen we listen intently and carefully to them and ask questions so we get to know them so they are heard. And then we see that when a student walks into our classroom, they're more than just the student who's in that classroom. They are also the, the kid who's on the playground. The, there's the kid who's after school. Maybe they're the older child who has a job, is playing, uh, is on the, the school play, uh, or is, you know, what who they are when they're at home. So it's really understanding that whole child and thinking about, is this where we're starting from? And if we start from the whole child perspective, we, we approach the kid in a slightly different way than if we're just approaching them from just an academic point of view, for example. So another mental model, and in our book, we talk about a number of mental models, but two in which we have grounded the book in um, is not only a holistic approach and a developmental approach to understanding the whole child, but also an ecological approach, a systems approach, and thinking about um, schools as living, breathing um, organisms. You know, all so for example, when you walk into a school building, what does it feel like to walk through those doors? In terms of you get a feel for the emotional tone of the building, you get a feel for not only the physical environment, but also the psychological environment. And um, one of the critical considerations in terms of um, thinking about a whole school approach is school as kind of a safe base, a safe haven for students begins to frame, you know, the question of safety and safety being both physical safety as well as um, psychological safety. So wanting schools to be a place where all students feel welcome, all students feel a sense of connection and belonging, um, a sense of a community. And at the heart of it, we've been framing the question of if we were to organize schools around thinking about mental health, what would the school look like, feel like, and be like? But in terms of this interconnection between, you know, the person and the environment, um, a useful uh, model and framework is to think systemically and a, a way of kind of having a clear vision of who you are, what you do, but how that aligns with practices and programs and within the system in and of itself. And it's about connection, belonging, and community. Yeah, in fact, we we talk, we hear a lot. Many schools across uh, the United States have moved to uh, what they call developing a portrait of a graduate. This idea of the whole child was seeing what is that child going to look like when they graduate, and that that is a goal that we should have. And it's a really wonderful way of getting us thinking in in the same direction and heading in the same direction about what we're doing in schools. We feel like we should also have a portrait of a school. So in the same way we think holistically about where do we want to be with a student, we should be thinking about where do we want to be when it comes to 
the school as a, as a, as a system, as Tom said. So one of the other critical ideas, and as I introduced myself, I talked a little bit about school as and teaching as emotional work. And one of the quotes that is near and dear to my heart is um, the work of Parker, Parker Palmer. And so Parker Palmer has this incredible quote that often anchors me in my thinking and my experience in schools. And it's small wonder then that teaching tugs at the heart opens the heart, even breaks the heart. And the more one loves teaching, the more heartbreaking it can be. That the courage to teach is the courage to keep one's heart open in those very moments when the heart is asked to hold more than it is able, so that teachers and students and subject can be woven into a fabric of community that living and learning require. Uh, often I kind of ground myself in thinking about that quote because it kind of presents this, provides this opening in thinking about creating a culture and a climate of care. That idea is of teaching as emotional work brings forth issues of wonder and awe, but it also kind of takes us to places and experiences of vulnerability. And so teaching is both can be heartwarming and heartbreaking. But as we think of culture and the forces that really kind of contribute to a sense of safety, a feeling of belonging, um, we need to attend to culture. And in our culture, staying attuned to climate and climate and culture go hand in hand. And at the, at the heart of climate and culture is the experience of relationships. And again, the experience of being seen, known, valued, an experience of being engaged and a feeling of belonging that must be um, cultivated and attended to um, every day. So we want to kind of frame this idea of a culture of care. And, and I just got I got I got to point out this great picture and and this is Dana Butler who is an amazing principal now retired but if I when I think about you know a principal who's creating a culture of care Dana is certainly one of those people who uh, is a role model for me in terms of doing that and this picture just captures this uh, so wonderfully so in addition to the a culture of care, we've um, used the, this is uh, can be a familiar model, the multi-tiered systems approach in terms of thinking about um, mental health in schools. That a culture of care can be evident and seen in how a school kind of integrates a continuum of care, which is organized, aligned, and an integrated set of practices, of policies and strategies that consider the needs and issues and resources of the individual um, in the school um, and the school as a community. You know, it's based upon needs where there's an assessment and a thinking of how we can shift our thinking about the needs of students, not just being around um, those of mastery of learning and surviving, but how we can help all students to thrive. Um, and so this MTSS model uh, frames this continuum of care. And one of the things that we are keenly kind of focused upon is that tier one level. Um, those types of universal kind of strategies and programs that kind of um, can, be, can embed prevention within school with this idea that um, as you move up the, the tiers on this, um, par this pyramid, one of the things to consider is that a healthy school before crises will be a healthy school after a crisis. But we want to embed prevention um, and universal strategies and techniques and programs for all students and staff. So in fact, when we think about these five uh, tips that we're giving you today, uh, take a whole child approach, whole school approach, create a culture of caring, teaching SCL, learning about neuroscience and shifting restorative practices, these are really all tier one uh, for everyone. These are these are changes that will impact everyone across the whole school. And again, uh, Tom often says we want to make sure that we're you know really addressing the 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 upstream issues to fix the downstream problems. And that's why we lean so heavily into prevention uh, when we do work with schools, when we do workshops. 
probably 70% of our time uh, is spent focusing on prevention. And, and we certainly do talk about intervention and postvention, but for us, intervention is where uh, that's the right place to spend more of our time. And again, I think that's something we need to shift in schools is going to more intervention. I'm sorry, in, uh, uh, prevention uh, strategies and making sure that we're spending more time in that first tier of the pyramid here. So one of the places that we can do that is uh, through social and emotional learning skills. And, and in so many schools, life skills, whatever we want to call these, uh, these are the, the core skills about living and learning that we know from research study after research study continue to show that when we focus on these life skills, when we focus in every classroom every day, when we, we, we really make it, this a uh, 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 something we do very consciously in our schools, very systematically in our schools, that we see all kinds of positive results from doing that work. So what are we talking about? This is the, uh, the wheel from the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning, or CASEL. You may be familiar with this. If you're not, you can look up C-A-S-E-L uh, dot org and, and learn more. But these are the five uh, Castle uh, SEL skills or life skills, self-awareness and self-management, social awareness and relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. And you'll see that those are surrounded by what happens in classrooms, schools, families and caregivers, and in communities, um, and that these things are supposed to permeate everywhere. When a school has a systematic conscious approach to social and emotional learning skill instruction, meaning it's happening in classrooms. It's not just 10 minutes a week. It's actually happening in every classroom every day. We see uh, grades improve. We see attendance improve. We do see test scores improve. We see uh, school climate results improve. I like coming to school. I like being here. Uh, and we see things like bullying and harassment go down. We see disciplinary problems reduce. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not a magic bullet, but boy, it really has an impact and, and up to 11 percentile points in all those areas. So, you know, when we talk with principals about one thing you could do in your school that might really change things for you and your, your kids and your staff is to really explicitly teach these SEL skills. So SEL skills are necessary, but not completely sufficient in terms of addressing mental health. So one of the things that we uh, encourage is a focus upon another mental model that we have in the book, and that's neuroscience. Um, the brain, we've learned an awful lot about the brain in the past 20 plus years. Um, and one of the things that we believe is that by teaching mental health literacy um, and teaching about stress and stress response can be integrated in um, both within a classroom, but within the school at large. So a couple of ideas that we'd like to just frame in terms of um, neuroscience is um, to start with not only the brain, but the body. And in starting with the body, one idea that is, it sounds simple, but it's really much more complex is paying attention to the nervous system. And our nervous systems are incredibly wise. Um, our, our, our nervous system constantly scans the environment for a number of things. One is this idea of safety. You know, kind of we're, we're continually scanning the environment for, is it safe? Even when we're asleep, if you hear a clap of thunder outside, you're going to get on, you're, you're going to get activated in some way and be responsive. But being able to pay attention to the mind, body, and brain connection kind of is something that is a useful strategy um, that can be embedded in a number of different ways. So um, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have a picture of the brain and the head and recognizing that the brain is a complex system and learning machine, that the brain is the only social organ of the body, and that um, we are hardwired and we're hardwired for survival and 
connection. So when you think of the brain as malleable and it's bi-directional, means that we, through the notion of neuroplasticity, we take an experience. We take an experience, and particularly when we are safe and feel grounded and related, we're open to learning. So teaching about the neurosciences, the working of the brain, the body, and the mind gives us a basis to understand stress and the different types of stress that we can experience. It also provides us opportunity to learn about coping skills and strategies and the stress response. But going back to this idea of neuroscience, it provides us this opportunity um, to learn about self-regulation and for adults, co-regulation. So the concept of neuroplasticity kind of creates this opening to understand how the outside world gets into us, but also that how we can um, address challenges and attend to um, stress uh, for better and for worse. So when you look at this, the brain in um, the head, there are three regions that are underscored. Um, one is um, the hippocampus, which sometimes when you refer can refer to as the storage cabinet of the brain, stored memories, working memories, short-term memory, long-term memory. The part that I'd like to underscore is the role of the amygdala. And the amygdala, a metaphor that sometimes is used, is it's the emotional center of the brain or the fire alarm of the brain. And when it is activated, um, it kind of is a way in which we're reading the environment, but also as a way in which we're regulating um, the body. So the other part of the brain um, to note is the prefrontal cortex, which is the CEO of the brain, the part of the brain that's responsible for executive functions like problem solving, decision making, rational thinking, focusing attention, impulse control, delaying gratification, all those functions that um, are, are required to kind of think rationally and reasonably. But when we are under stress, when we're experiencing stress and um, the amygdala is, is activated, um, we can, we're often going offline in terms of rational thinking. So the critical part to attend to is when we are under stress and dysregulated, being able to calm ourselves is one way of grounding ourselves to deal with stressors and stress and the experience that we're having. And um, when we're activating, we are experiencing a flood of hormones that are circulating. And there's something um, 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 called the 90-second rule. And the 90-second rule is the amount of time it takes for the stress hormone to circulate through the body. So being able to calm ourselves in a period in a state of distress and then name the feelings, attend to the feelings that we're experiences, experience, allow us to go online with the prefrontal cortex, which then allows us to think more clearly about the experience that we're having. So one part of teaching about neuroscience is kind of recognizing that mind, body, and brain connection, recognizing um, how our nervous systems can get readily activated, but also kind of learning about the stress response. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, from a, from a, a, a teaching perspective, so there's, there's, for me, we say understand neuroscience. This means that kids should understand neuroscience and kids as young as, you know, four or five can understand neuroscience. They can understand everything Tom just said. When we have children who are uh, a little dysregulated, we have them do some deep breathing, three deep belly breaths. We have them count to five. This helps with that regulation. And of course, all the way up, I was telling a story to Tom and, and Jessica earlier about some of my college students I was with just a few hours ago who were showing some anxiety uh, around going into schools tomorrow. And so I, I gave them some advice on how to calm themselves. So even uh, you know, young adults and adults need this work as well. But certainly teachers, I think where the real power is, is when we have teachers who understand this and, and where we wanna go with this is two places. One is 
it does my students no good to try to teach them about any content, any academic content, if the amygdala has taken over. If the prefrontal cortex is offline, there's no reason for me to go forth with the lesson. They're not gonna understand the reading. They're not gonna understand the math. They're not gonna understand uh, the history I'm trying to teach them right now. Uh, it's it, We really need teachers to understand that, that we need to first address this part, right? The 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 part that the, 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 the response uh, that Tom's talking about. And then the second thing is, where can we build this into our lessons? Just like with SEL, if we can build SEL into our lessons and into what we do naturally in our academic content, we can also do that with understanding neuroscience. And so there's a lot of research around what we can do to get kids up and moving around, getting them feeling calm, uh, getting them into the, the moment where they can be at their best. They, they aren't gonna be at their best in terms of logic and thinking, if the amygdala is is fully engaged. So when we teach about um, the brain and neuroscience, we're also kind of linking it to teaching about the stress response. And um, the stress response has been encoded in our evolutionary DNA for millennium. Um, it's our way of dealing with threat um, or danger. And as I mentioned earlier with the nervous system, we're always on high alert for stress or danger. The other part of what Tim was referencing in terms of teaching both students, but also staff about some of the basics and just some fundamental ideas about neuroscience is this notion of mirror neurons. And that um, one way of framing that is that a um, dysregulated teacher or staff member or adult cannot be very helpful to a dysregulated child or student. Um, but a well-regulated adult can be extraordinarily helpful to a dysregulated child in that. So learning about the stress response, and there's um, um, a lot of work being done. Um, Lawrence Steinberg out of Temple has this um, proposition in which he says that the single most important skill that we can teach our youth is the capacity for self-regulation. And one way teachers can best do that teaching is to model it in that. So when you think of the stress response, on one hand, uh, we're framing the sympathetic and um, the parasympathetic part of the nervous system. The sympathetic part of the nervous system, uh, the metaphor uh, could be the ex accelerator in a, in a car. Um, that when we are under stress, we automatically go into a, um, especially distress, um, a fight, flight, freeze mode, um, where we're, we're activated to respond, to run, and with prolonged stress, we can um, become exhausted, shut down, and collapse. But learning about how stress impacts um, the body, especially in managing the sympathetic part of the nervous system, is learning to manage um, anxiety, um, learning to manage um, stress, and that recognizing that not all stress is 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 inherently bad. It's the uh, concept of eustress and distress. Um, and one of the things that we know in coping patterns and strategy is cultivating the capacity for resilience and helping our students deal with um, not only stress to stress, but also dealing with toxic stress. And one of the things that we know about um, relationships is that um, a protective relationship with one adult can be um, a protective factor for, for students. But when you're thinking about the stress response um, and the parasympath the sympathetic part of the nervous system, there's also the parasympathetic part of the nervous system, which is the tend and befriend part of the nervous system. It's um, the part of the nervous system that um, is focused upon resting and digesting in that. And anytime we cultivate a positive emotional experience, joy, wonder, appreciation, gratitude, we're building capacity and we're building the parasympathetic nervous system, part of the nervous system to kind of deal with experiences and with stress. 
So pausing in school for celebrations is actually a um, an, an asset that builds capacity and builds strengths, as well as builds relationship, which is the central part of the nervous system, which is the social engagement system. And we often like to quote the work of James Comer, and who says who states that all significant and meaningful learning takes place in significant relationships. So relationships, you know, to the work, relationships among each other and to students, um, that sense of belonging, community, and connection. So one other idea, and this, this is work that's drawn from Daniel Siegel, Dan Siegel. Um, if you don't know his work, um, Google him. Uh, he's just a prolific writer, research, uh, has a lot of YouTubes on. Uh, a handy model of the brain that would describe that the brain on, in the head. But he also has this metaphor that we think is a very useful metaphor that can be extraordinarily helpful um, to students and um, to teachers. And it's um, the metaphor of the window of tolerance. And the window of tolerance references an optimal zone of functioning. It's a range where you can feel that you can deal with what's happening in the experience in the moment and recognizing that our windows open and or shrink. Um, but the really critical issue is how we attend to it. So knowing where and when and how you are in your window and the key strategy idea is how and when you get pulled out of your window um, of tolerance. You know, it builds upon this concept of, um, and it's a stress management concept of homeostasis, that um, when we are, um, that we're self-regulating throughout the course of the day, periods of days, where, periods in the day where we are kind of um, high energy, um, the rhythms of the day, and there are times in the day where we have low energy, you know, like right after lunch and you've had a big lunch and you're feeling that you're kind of sluggish. But knowing when you get pulled out of this window is um, um, an adaptive coping strategy because it's at those points that you can put in place ways of coping and dealing and responding to um, the stress, for example. So in this window, in this metaphor, he frames um, two um, states that do relate to the fight, flight, freeze response. So one is being in a state of hyper arousal which is emotional overload. It's where you might be seeing kind of um, a shutdown uh, in terms of impulsivity or hypervigilance or defensive reactions. Um, but that's a state where the, our thinking, and these, this is a, uh, also a cognitive kind of framework, so our thinking becomes a bit um, disjointed, um, chaotic. We can't process information as quickly. It's like being on stress overload. The other part of the window is the a state of hypoarousal. And hypoarousal, the metaphor that I sometimes, the imagery that I sometimes think is a useful one that we all are probably well familiar with is the deer in the headlights look. When you kind of are seeing somebody and they have a, a gaze that's a thousand miles away, it's a sense of being numb, being lethargic, not having much um, energy. It's um, a period, it's a state of being shut down in that. So noticing this and teaching this window of tolerance can be a way of um, really kind of attending to the needs of a student or a group. But also there are coping strategies that can be done when you recognize when you are um, outside of your window or when you're being pulled outside of the window. So like in a state of hyperarousal, the task becomes, as Tim was referencing, a calming strategy taking three really deep breaths and centering and grounding yourself or the student that you're with. But the other part is in the state of hypoarousal, you need to activate the body. And so like movement activities or something that is energizing, um, something that can kind of help ground us, ground the person in terms of feeling a sense of connection to their body or to each other is a useful activity and strategy. But this is one of those kind of, um, um, sometimes uh, Tim references low-hanging fruit, 
Teaching the window of tolerance is a strategy that can be, you know, taught and practiced. And the more we practice it, the better we get at it. As Tom and I have gone across the country and across the, the, uh, the state that we're in, whenever we do work with administrators, especially, you know, uh, really experienced administrators, we put this graphic up. And it probably gets the biggest response from uh, from everyone in the room uh, because it just really nails uh, sort of how we all are. Uh, you know, we're within that window or we're outside the window and we're outside the window. You know, I think we've tended to focus a little on the hyper uh, with kids and we we really haven't also identified, you know, the hypo and 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 how we can move ourselves and cope and get back into that window of tolerance. But, you know, for me, this is, if I'm a school leader today, this is a, a 10 minute TED talk at a staff meeting with some conversation then amongst the staff that I think would have a huge impact on, again, shifting our thinking or helping to explain things uh, that will help me when I walk into the classroom the next day. Yeah, and then in the chat, Beth had referenced, you know, it's, it is similar to zones of regulation. It's another model that complements uh, where are you within the zone and being able, you know, one of the really adaptive coping strategies is to be able to not only feel what you're feeling, but being able to name it in terms of where are you within those zones. So it's a it's another complementary strategy that can go hand in hand with um skill development. So we've talked about taking a whole child, whole school approach, creating a culture of caring, teaching those important social and emotional learning skills and understanding neuroscience. And then the last tip we would give uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a, maybe a heavier lift for some schools in some places, um, but it's, it's essential. Uh, and it's based on everything we've talked about so, so far, which is to shift ourselves to towards restorative practices. And when we talk about this, uh, you know, we're, we, we, we've been through a hundred years of really punitive practices. That's been our approach to working with kids who might be out of their window of tolerance or might be uh, acting out in some way uh, is to, our, our pension has been to kick them out of class and kick them out of school. And we've enacted over the last 20, 30 years uh, 20 years especially, these zero tolerance policies that have led to a spike in the number of young people who have ended up outside of the school system, on the streets, uh, in the prisons. And, and there's a real problem that schools, I think, and we think, have played a role in driving kids away. And, and where that begins is how do we work with children in a way that keeps them in our community. And our community is our classroom and our school and our and our and the community around the school. And so a shift to restorative practices means we move away from the punitive. We move away from asking the question, what's wrong with you? And moving towards the question of what's happening to you and what can I do to help? It doesn't mean that if a, a child has done something that is, you know, injured another or, you know, harmed another with words or deeds that we're not, there aren't going to be consequences. We're not talking about zero consequences. What we're talking about is how we're approaching those consequences and how we're turning it into a learning moment. Kids are going to make mistakes. Children are going to make mistakes. Uh, that's part of learning. Learning mistakes are okay. And sometimes those mistakes are going to break a rule. And so we have to think about how we're responding to those things. And uh, moving away from a punitive approach, moving towards an approach that is going to address the immediate needs of that child, uh, repair the harm if there has been harm. And the harm isn't just between one student and another student. Everybody is affected when there's something like this that has occurred. Um, how are we bringing the whole group together to work through that, to help that individual kid learn from their mistake, to come back and be part of the community, not ostracized, not separated from the community? Um, you know, I've always believed that, you know, my job is to give kids second and third chances. If I, I don't want to be in a profession that is one strike and you're out.
That's not, that's not what learning is about. We need to make some mistakes and we need to do it in safe ways and we need to help educate kids. So restorative practices are an approach that resolves conflicts, holding individuals and groups accountable, but also is trying to really bring the community back together to restore the relationships. And we do that through having an understanding of the whole child, through really excellent relationships and a culture of caring, through the teaching of SEL skills so that I'm aware, I'm managing, I'm aware of what I've done, I'm managing what I'm feeling and what I'm doing, I'm making responsible decisions. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly an understanding of neuroscience goes behind sort of what's happening to you, how can I help? These are all ways that we can move towards a more restorative approach. And there's lots of ways in schools that we can do this that are also going to help uh, engage us in better relationships and actually teach kids a little bit better. So um, earlier we referenced the MTSS model as a continuum of care. And one of the examples that we want to be able to illustrate as a way of rolling out a shift to historical restorative practices is the work of circles and circle keeping. So on a tier one, tier two, and tier three level to think about circle practices, on the tier one level where it's focusing upon, you know, um, skills, program services for all students, kind of that sense of universal, addressing universal needs. It's building a healthy community, which is essential for learning. Um, and it creates emotional and physical safety and frees the brain up for those higher level functions that a healthy community creates and requires a sense of belonging for every member of the community. It's an attention to developing skills for healthy relationships. And circle practices are excellent tools for practicing these skills of being in a healthy community, of building and maintain a healthy community it requires ongoing attention and practices, and it promotes better learning outcomes. But at the heart of it, it's cultivating a sense of belonging, developing skills along the lines of emotional intelligence, mutual respect collective responsibility, and that practicing these skills in a non-stressful context um, can also lead to cultivating community, but also creating joy. So on a universal level, um, this is a practice that probably those of you who um, may have experiences in kindergarten, early elementary school are well familiar with, and it's circle keeping time. And it may be celebration circles, check-in circles, learning circles, community building circles, kind of um, mindfulness-based circles. But it's a practice of building community that can take place within um, the classroom at um, any given time and moment. In that, But that universal approach in a tier one is embedding circle practices that are accessible and available to all students. And Tom and I... We, I was going to say, we've used these across grade levels, um, you know, pre-K through through high school. Uh, they, they're being used uh, in universities at the college level and uh, graduate level. And uh, Tom and I have used these in our work with our colleagues uh, and with other administrators. So it's one of those great uh, skills that we can bring to uh, any age group or venue to really, uh, you know, create the environment where people are really going to be able to be heard and to hear. You know, so then as you lean further into a circle practice in terms of a tier two level intervention, it's when there is a disruption within the community. And that disruptions occur as a normal part of our experiences, but they undermine the health of the community and impact the learning environment. So considering a healing response to those disruptions means how do you restore healthy community relationships, a sense of belonging and safety in that community, and that uh, refocus upon learning. And a, a circle in a tier two level intervention acknowledges the disruption and the impact that it has upon the members of the community. 
It engages community support for each other by working through those disruptions. It, in, it ensures and embeds accountability, which is also a factor to consider in, a, in disruption, but not only a focus upon accountability, but identifies steps for problem solving and to prevent the disruption from occurring again. So examples could be transition circles, collective group problem solving circles, healing circles, conflict management mediation circles, and circles that deal with grief and loss and the collective impact that they have. So thinking about the use of circles as a tier two level um, intervention, but the other part is for that five to 10% of our um, student body as um, a tier three intervention that um, rebuilds um, disruptions that have, occur have occurred within a community. And some of that may be, you know, restoring trust, establishing an atmosphere that in which the community can move towards um, healing, being able to use it to understand, you know, kind of chronic conditions that might be disrupting the school and learning environment and provide solutions um, to improve upon the learning environment. So these are harm reduction in terms of creating healing spaces for identified harm, um, rebuilding or building for a first time a, a greater sense of belonging, um, and enhancing the community that it's stronger before the disruption occurred and that um, it takes a community to heal. So these could be applied in so many different ways at these different levels. Um, I've certainly used them in, in, in academics as well as a tier one of, of, of a learning circle of, of you know, using the, the circle practice approach, but also seeing them, you know, especially when we talk about crisis uh, response and postvention, those circles can be critical in helping to get us back to a place of, of, of stasis where we can move forward. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those practices that when Tom and I think about healthy schools, when we think about a practice that really cuts across so many different uh, areas that the fact that we're not seeing circles being used more and more in our schools is something that we're you know, wondering and questioning because we really see it as almost a, a perfect pedagogy for healthy schools. You know, there, there's a question in the chat about using uh, meditation um, in a circle. Um, I would expand the meditation to mindfulness-based practices um, that, you know, it's also kind of teaching both skills. And there there's a, you know, a, a, a variety of structures and models that can be used in terms of often circles have an opening and a closing. And an opening might be something like Tim referenced earlier, those three deep breaths in terms of grounding and an arriving type of extra um, activity or something like a poem, um, but being able to kind of embed the kind of skills that you want to teach. And I think the more we can embed practices like mindfulness and restorative practices within a school's climate and culture, we're building capacity and skills, but we're also kind of cultivating kind of um, good mental health and good relational health. And, you know, to make it authentic, this is just like social emotional learning or learning about neuroscience to uh, to really make sure that it is, you know, truly integrated into what we're doing. You know, if you're doing one circle a year, that's not going to cut it. Uh, circles should be something that are being done constantly. And when we get to that place, boy, you know, it'll be so easy. It's so easy for students and the teacher to move in and out of that circle that it really becomes a natural teaching tool in so many different ways. Uh, and, you know, I think the evidence that we can point to, as several of you have mentioned, is the implementation of the morning meeting in a lot of our elementary classrooms has just become second nature. Every kid knows they get into that circle. They know the, the they know what they have to do and what they're doing it for. And that that becomes a more meaningful experience. But what's cooler then is that they could move into that circle at any point throughout the day and go in and out of that experience as a way to process information, as a way to celebrate, as a way to close the school day. Uh, so we see this as something that could be uh, a natural part of 
the, the, the toolbox, the tool in the toolbox that every teacher is using throughout the day. Yeah. In, in, in our book and as a resource, we referenced the work of Kay Prannis, um, who has just a text out on um, um, cir um, Circle Forward. And what Kay, um, we've quoted her in a book saying that everything experienced in Circle contributes to building community and trauma healing. But every time we are in Circle, we're teaching SEL. So, you know, a, a nice way of kind of framing some of the practices that um, we bring within schools that can, you know, build community, but also, you know, be um, teaching skills and a powerful tool to a restorative approach to behaviors that sometimes um, interfere with learning. So those are our five our five goals, our uh, five tips, our tips that we feel like if those were implemented in any school, we would see school climate results get stronger. We would see staff and students uh, feeling uh, a little more connected to the school and a little more uh, positive. And, you know, I, we, we kind of jokingly put the end happier, you know, in quotes or in parentheses at the end of this title of this. And, and I don't want to um, diminish um, the work that we do in schools and think we always have to be happy. But I have to say now, Tom and I have been doing this for a number of decades. When we go into schools, I mean, one of the things we've seen happen, especially the last five years, is that schools are maybe not as happy as they used to be. They used to be happier places uh, for all of us, for kids and adults. And, uh, you know, some of that is, is, our, is our culture. Some of it is our world that we live in today. Um, some of it is it's tough being a kid and it's tough being a teacher. Uh, it's tough being a, a principal, uh, tough being a school board member. Uh, you know, we, we, we think we've got to bring some joy back into schools. That's a word we love. We love that word joy, uh, engagement, deep engagement that's that's meaningful to who I am as an individual. And, and we believe that there are some, some practices, some things that we can change that will not only improve the mental health and wellness of kids and adults, but we think it'll deepen learning. And we're not the only ones. There's research that shows that when we attend to these things, uh, uh, those things get better. The question is, are we willing to let go of the recent past? Are we willing to let go of this, this focus that has been on um, things other than wellness? Uh, and that if we did focus on wellness, if we made decisions through that lens of mental health and wellness, we would make some different decisions that would lead us to healthier, happier schools, and more importantly, the people who inhabit them. <laughs> so that's really our, our, our hope in all of this. And, and building upon that is this vision of hoping to help schools find a way where they can help students not just kind of move up, survive, you know, that survival mode, but can thrive. You know, and Tim referenced experiences of joy. You know, I think the depth of learning really takes place not only where there is challenge, but also where there is um, the cultivation of joy. So we'd love to have any additional questions, but for now, I think we're going to uh, take a moment to hand it back over to Jessica, and then we can we can hopefully answer some questions if you have them. But it looks like a couple of questions have come in. Uh, so it looks like Crystal has a question. Uh, for students who are overwhelmed and almost numb, do you have extra tips on how to help them better access their education? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that um, we, we hadn't talked about in, is the impact that not only of stress and anxiety, but also of trauma and understanding, you know, what are the signs of um, someone who is really kind of grappling with kind of a trauma history and to, uh, ways of engaging them. But I think um, in terms of that whole school approach, in terms of thinking about school as a safe base, as a safe haven, and embedding kind of resource and resourcing within schools in terms of like teaching about that stress response and calming strategies. You know, um, we um, have been in some classrooms where teachers have embedded, you know, kind of brain breaks, so to speak, but the brain breaks are actually to teach some skills and to think in creatively about, you know, that whole idea of making the nervous system our friend 
you know, it's a loose metaphor, but to think about when we are either shut down and numb, what do we need in order to feel not only safe, but engaged? And one of the antidotes is, um, are the relationships. So a relationship where a student who is shut down has a helpful adult and a caring adult who is present in them and available to them and can be a resource and help them to be resourceful themselves, I think is one way to begin to think about, you know, how to help that student who may be um, shut down. In the and, you know, I'll, I'll add this, uh, and this may respond to a couple of other comments that have been made uh, in the chat. Uh, this isn't called the book is not called the students we need now. It's it's the schools we need now. And just just as I'm just I'm very worried as the school administrator, I think it's our responsibility to create the conditions where kids feel engaged, where there is engagement happening, where there are engaged learning, there's engaged classrooms, there's engaged teachers, there's uh, ma classroom materials where there's curriculum that looks like me and speaks to who I am as a student and as a young person, and not something that's outside of me. Uh, is the school about the teacher or is the school about me as the student? There, there's so many things that I think we could do better in schools to help increase engagement, help support students, not put this on the backs of teachers and students, that it's your job to uh, engage in self-care. It's your job, student, to, to find your engagement in the school and in the material and what you're learning. It really needs to be, have we done everything in our school to make this the safest, most engaging, most caring place it could be in every corner of the school. And, and I'd like to see us do that first. And I think if we could do that first, I think we would solve a, a lot of these issues. So I would maybe leave us here, as I know we're running out of time, but leave us with this thought of, it's our responsibility. These are We're the leaders of these schools. We're the ones who are creating the world in which these young people are stepping in. Uh, what are we doing to make sure it's a world where they are going to be able to be their best person? And uh, I think we have a lot of work to do there. And that's what we're trying to suggest in the book, that every school should have a mental health action plan. And that plan should take them to a place where they've created a school where every kid uh, feels engaged, and every adult working there feels safe and engaged. So, Tim, you also put forth on an article that we, um, did you mention yes. that already? We haven't mentioned that. So we actually have a final gift that we're going to make sure everyone who attends here gets, and that's an extended article that we've written, almost like an extra chapter to the book, uh, but it's an extended uh, article about this topic, five uh, ways to make your schools healthier and happier. Uh, we will we can put that in the chat. We'll make sure that you get that. It'll also be attached to the recording uh, on YouTube so you can get that. So that's a gift from us to you. There it is. Thank you, Olivia. That's our gift to you. And uh, we hope that this is a, an additional way to deepen your thinking about this topic. And our thanks for coming out and being a part of this great webinar today. And thank you both so much. It has been a great time. Uh, if anyone has any questions that didn't get answered today, uh, feel free to send those to us at info at Corwin.com and we'll gladly pass them along to Tim and Tom. I, and thank you again to, uh, to both of you. Uh, thank you for everyone who's participated and joined us today and have a great rest of your week. Thank you very much. Goodbye.